Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette, discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free, <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Greetings, listeners. You're listening to Movie Oubliette, the hemisphere encompassing podcast with me, Dan, possibly helping out with a lo fi hip hop Christmas album down here in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> and me, Conrad, trying desperately not to be swept away by Black Friday sales in Cambridge, UK. <laughs> yes, they always get you. Uh, in this podcast, we ponder over genre films, horror, sci-fi and fantasy, because fairy tales aren't complete without attempted cannibalism, comas, and seven unconventional dwarves. <laughs> Hello, Codrat. Hello, Dan. How are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, but I'm getting very tempted by all of these sales because... We don't even know what Black Friday is over here. It just suddenly started to happen. All of a sudden, at this time of year, you just get bombarded with these massive discounts and amazing deals. Yeah. And, yeah, my credit card gets hammered. <laughs> yeah. As especially all these, um, pl like, audio plug-in companies yeah. are always yeah. part of it as well. It's like, ooh, 40% off, 60% off. And it's, yeah, it's it's even, you don't even have to leave your house. You can just I know. spend your entire savings on everything. You, you can, need. yeah. <laughs> Whilst adding to the supply chain problem by buying more and more products you don't need. But there we go. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're getting lo-fi this Christmas. Well, I mean... You've been invited as well to to contribute, oh, and, yes. and you did you did uh you did do a couple of tracks last year, didn't you? For our I did good, good friend Blake. Yes, hello Blake. But yeah, <laughs> lo-fi hip hop Christmas music. Uh, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, I'll probably just end up doing some pizzicato strings, but you know me. <laughs> <laughs> but they always sound great. <laughs> they do. <laughs> So anything great coming from the mailbag today, Conrad? What have our listeners been talking to us about? Well, Kevin from Planet X, still love that username, on <laughs> Fire in the Sky got in touch to say, Dan asked about young children watching Fire in the Sky. Well, I was maybe seven when I saw this film with my family. We were visiting relatives who lived in rural Michigan. So oh, in addition yes. to being traumatised by the finale, my folks and I had to endure a 30-minute car ride back home in near complete what? darkness across nothing but evergreens <laughs> and farmland. No one said a word during the trip home and at least two of us had abduction nightmares later on. Oh. <laughs> this movie left such an impression that I would get a pang of anxiety just seeing it on the shelf at the <laughs> store. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll get no you. No wonder. You, you, don't, you, don't, <laughs> you don't want to relive sort of moments of the film after watching the film. No, I remember the time, I don't know if I've told this story, going to see the Blair Witch Project in the cinema by myself and then walking through the woods in the dark what? to get home <laughs> afterwards. That was not a good idea. I was terrified. <laughs> wow, yeah, I would be too. Yeah. I remember watching The Ring for the first time and refusing to watch the television for yeah. like weeks <laughs> I, I, I just know. didn't want it to turn on or off or switch channels by itself I was just, yeah yep Scott. I know I watched it in my bedroom with a TV in the corner of the room <laughs> could I sleep with that thing <laughs> oh no that was not wise mm. mm -hmm. Uh, we also had lots of feedback on our Starman post about the creepy baby uh, because we asked what's your nomination for creepiest ah. baby in movie history and we had lots of options here. Glazy UK said Baby Selwyn from Brain Dead. Brain Dead. Is that that's the, the Kiwi movie? Yeah, I think it is. It must be the Peter oh. Jackson movie. Yes, is I do remember Is it a zombie baby? Vaguely recall it. I think it's... 
in the flat that he goes to and there's a baby and there's a guy. I can't remember. I have to watch that movie yeah. again. It's so long since I've seen it. So, yeah. But it brings a bell. It does. Uh, Toy Chasers says the baby from Bright Lights Big City was a little weird. I don't, I've never seen I that. had never seen this. So this is a Michael J. Fox movie, and I just thought it was like The Secret of My Success or whatever. It's from 1988. Uh -huh. But I just watched this on YouTube, and there is this dream sequence where he talks to a baby that's inside a woman. She's pregnant, and she's in a coma. And Michael J. Fox talks to the baby through like a transparent window in her stomach. Okay. And it's this freaky animatronics baby that talks like Michael J. Fox, but high pitched. What, what, what? the hell is going on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Right. I okay. did not even know that that existed. So thanks for alerting us to that, Toy mm. Chasers. <laughs> Kylie Cat said, you got to look into reborn dolls. They can make anything you can imagine and look super realistic. And they are used a lot when they require a doll that looks like a real baby in movies and TV. Oh, is this a company? It's um, lots of different people make them. But yeah, they're made out of silicone in some cases. And right. They're sort of well into the uncanny valley. Actually, my mum collects them. So oh. I'm quite familiar with them. <laughs> okay. They are pretty freaky with their glassy-eyed stares, but <laughs> they make her very happy, so that's all good. <laughs> okay. Isaac, last name, our good friend who's been on the pod several times and looks after our socials for <laughs> us. He said, I nominate that awful scene from The Brood with baby Spider-Man from Trainspotting as a running mate. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Yeah. You, can't, you can't overlook Trainspotting. No, you can't. No, that one scarred everyone for quite some time. <laughs> uh, Luis Saavedra got in touch to say, does Quarto from Total Recall count? Oh, remind me of that character. So that's the mutant baby that's sort of glued onto a guy in Total Recall. Do you remember that? Oh, right. That's right. Yeah. I don't know whether they're sort of conjoined uh, twins so. or it's yeah. another half of him or what's going on there. I think so. I think it's pressing the same buttons, mm -hmm. isn't it? Creepy yeah. baby. Similar vein. Open your mind. Yeah. Pretty creepy. And finally, Demon Jacket said, I mean, it's got to be a razor head, baby. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, it starts, doesn't it, really? That movie still yeah. confuses me. <laughs> I still don't really understand what I watched. No, but it's, uh, yeah, it creates a mood, that's for sure. Yeah, and the fact that it was, it wasn't there like a three-year gap? Like they made most of the movie and then there was three years and they finished it? yeah. I think it was one of those ones where it was um, a, a labour of love over quite a long period of time. Uh-huh, yeah, right. Yeah. On Starman, we were talking about Tom Cruise almost being cast in the lead role, and Reclaimer's Vintage Toys says, Bridges is outstanding in that film, and I don't think anyone else would have brought that same game to the table. Then again, Tom Cruise is from outer space. <laughs> 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 well, Scientologists after all Indeed, yeah So it's kind of st stunt casting almost at that point But yeah, there we go And of course we heard from Surge of Cold Crash Pictures Hello Surge, <laughs> hey, Surge. Hey, Surge. Who said on Starman I get more mileage out of Starman When I make my own decision about what it's actually about Alien romance? Not for me Government mm. conspiracy chase film? Not so much Road trip about processing your grief? Now that's more like it. Movie Oubliette reviewed this forgotten entry in John Carpenter's filmography this week, and I think it's especially interesting that he made this film mostly because he thought the opposite of the thing would be good for his career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is very true, but it's quite a sad state of affairs, I think, that he felt it was necessary to do mm. that. But Yeah. Yeah. But we got a memorable movie in the process, so mm. that's all good. So thanks, everyone, for getting in touch. We always love hearing from you. Please do comment and uh, email us whenever you can. Yes, yes, please do. All right, Conrad, what is the film that we will be covering today? Well, let me saunter on over to the Oubliette and uh, find out. Oh, oh. Why, it's a 
lovely bedroom in here today. Yeah, very ornate. Mm, it's beautiful. Oh, look at this furniture. Let me just open this wardrobe with the clasped hands. Oh, oh there's a mirror inside and my goodness, I, I do look good in it. <laughs> Quite right. You do look incredibly handsome. I can't believe you were a child in the 80s. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. That's, that's very, very kind. What's that you have in your hand? It's a movie. Oh, thanks very much. Okay. Oh, can I put you in a box? Well, Conrad, you're looking pretty flustered. Oh, I do. Honestly, I'm blushing. That's just so nice. What a pick me up. <laughs> so, what did you pick up from the movie today? <laughs> so, I have Snow White, A Tale of Terror the 1997 American Gothic fantasy horror film based on the fairy tale of the same name, directed by Michael Cohn with a screenplay from Tom Solosi. I'm not sure how to say that surname, I'm really sorry, mm -hmm. and Deborah Sarah, based, of course, on Snow White by the Brothers Grimm, and it stars none other than Sigourney Weaver, Sam Neill, Monica Keener, Gil Bellows and David Conrad. Mm. So I guess we all know what this movie's about. Has it, <laughs> has it, has it been reimagined? Well, quite. We all know the story of Snow White, the beautiful young girl, the vain and cruel stepmother with the magic mirror who plots to kill her because she's jealous of just how hot she is, the seven dwarves she befriends whilst hiding in the woods, becoming a domestic goddess, the poisoning by magic apple, and the resurrection by true love's kiss from a handsome prince. But what if the stepmother were actually a damaged, brittle but ordinary woman turned sour by Snow White's repeated and bratty rejections? What if her vanity was triggered by Snow White's brazen attempts to steal her father's attention, dressing up as her dead mother? What if the dwarves were actually seven not-so-merry outlaws who were one knife fight away from raping Snow White? What if the prince were a useless twat who sits idly by while the hottest, stubbliest outlaw administers the Heimlich manoeuvre? Well, we're about to find <laughs> out, Dan, because this is the gritty, gothic, definitely not for the kids, 90s edition of Snow White, complete with zombie premature babies, upside-down crucifixions, and a torched Sigourney Weaver screaming like a banshee. Let's get grim after the break. <laughs> <laughs> Let's... And we're back to talk about Snow White, A Tale of Terror. Dan, had you seen this before? No, no, I'd never heard of it until fairly recently. Mm. Yeah, I, I was very intrigued. You know, A Tale of Terror. Mm. Sounds like everything I ever want in a grim fairy tale. I want horror and grittiness and dark themes. <laughs> I didn't quite get that. No. I mean, there's a lot of anticipation in the opening with the carriage being attacked by wolves mm. and blood in the snow behind the title. You think, wow, we're really in for something pretty grim here, Yeah, <laughs> to coin a phrase. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, not so much. Yeah, I, I felt like it wasn't different enough from what we know as Snow White. It wasn't hugely new. There weren't a huge amount of additions or extra levels of character development. It felt like just the story. Yeah, pretty much, except for it tries to engage in a little bit more psychosexual analysis of the characters. Sure. It is very much more female focused. Yeah, that's true. Although Snow White is basically not a protagonist at all. Does she do anything? But it's certainly focused on her and the stepmother and the relationship there. The men are completely sidelined. Sam Neill spends most of the movie laid up in bed with a broken leg mm. and the prince is largely absent and when he does turn up he's bloody useless. Yeah. So it is very much focused on the women, this story. Yeah, that's true. I kind of, my impression of when I first watched this was there were no characters in this movie. <laughs> there was 
Of course, Sigourney Weaver's character, um, is her name Claudia? Yeah. And Monica Keener as Lily. But not much else. Like, every character kind of felt completely one-dimensional. Like, there wasn't anything else. Like, even the dwarves. So there's only actually one short person. Yeah. Everyone else is just deformed or scarred, normal-sized human. Yeah. All of those characters... I couldn't tell them apart, apart from their physical attributes. Like, everything else was the same. And lost opportunity. I mean, you're supposed to make the dwarves memorable. They're supposed to be the characters that develop Snow White as a character from being a child to a woman, I guess. Yeah. But they don't. No. That whole sequence, I mean, it's supposed to be, you know, the princess brought low having to learn life in the woods and she learns a little bit of, you know, the reality of being at the bottom of the food chain in terms of the social structure of this world. Mm. I didn't get much of that. I, I mean, didn't you had, get that at all. No. You have one scene where she's knocking around in there. They're in a church, aren't they? The, yeah. And she doesn't do anything And then they go off working in the mine and she sees one snake get spooked and goes with them and the mine collapses and then they go home. And she's not there. It doesn't feel like she's there for long. Not much happens, really. Yeah, The middle section's weird. Oh, I felt like most of the movie was... (laughs) My my main concern about this movie is it felt really unfocused. Mm. Like, I never really knew where the story was going. Like, it didn't seem to have a, oh, we have to do this now, or we have to do this now. Things kind of resolved themselves. Yeah. Like, Snow White going into a coma from biting the apple, I thought that would have been a bigger deal. Yeah. But it just really wasn't. No. And they didn't even really figure out how to wake her up. She wakes up by herself. Yeah. With no prompting or no kiss or anything. It was just, huh? Like, I I felt like, oh... It's just a series of problems solving themselves. Yes, I know. And with no protagonists that are actually actively engaged in solving anything. Yeah. Or really emotionally invested in anyone or any particular outcome. Nobody seems to be trying to do anything. Exactly. And I don't know whether it was me, but I I felt confused by the passage of time as well. Yeah. I don't know how long she was uh, missing for. No. Like, it felt like days. Yeah. Because (laughs) no one aged at all. But then her father seemed to think he hadn't seen her in years. I don't know. It was really confusing. Like, there didn't seem to be a progression of time elapsing. It was just like she was gone and she's back. Yeah. And I don't know. (laughs) Now, in fairness, the director does have a commentary. It's only available on the Blu-ray in Germany, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. Any other incarnation of it that you can manage to find either in the US or in the UK is bare bones. You'll be lucky if it's high definition. This film is very hard to come by. Mm. So the commentary is really interesting. The director to talks about this movie being compromised in post-production. Right. So he was locked out of the editing room and large chunks of the movie were excised. It's a 101-minute movie and he talks about all of the bits that were taken out and all of the subplots that you lost as a result and how much he feels as though the second and particularly the third acts are problematic as a result of it yeah it kind of makes me want to see what he actually intended in the first place Mm. because the first act i think is really good yeah it's really strong yeah it really sets it up it does yeah the dynamic between sigourney weaver as lady claudia and lily seeing them vying for the father's affection and Mm. exploring the vulnerabilities in these two characters that you get the feeling that Claudia is trying to satisfy or outdo her own mother. Right. She's trying to live up to something. And, you know, a deeply wounded human being that's looking for love and looking for recognition. And Lily just wanting affection, not wanting to see her father's sole focus on her being diluted with another woman because Claudia has this relationship with her father that she can't have, which is sexual. It's made very clear and sure. beautifully acted by both. It's Yeah, it's interesting knowing that there are bits missing because it felt mm. unfocused. Like there were all these parts that were supposed to link together that didn't. Mm. And, and especially that final act, 
I almost felt like, what are they doing here? Yeah. What are they trying to do? Like, it didn't even feel like it was going to any sort of final conclusion at all. No. So the mirror, is a mirror from Sleeping Beauty or Snow White? I got confused. Mirror, mirror on the wall is Snow White. Yeah. That is Snow and it's, White. it's all about vanity. And it's fairly simple in the original folktale, I believe. It's, she keeps asking the mirror who is the fairest of them all. So just physical attraction yeah and up until the point where lily comes of age it's always the evil stepmother Mm. but as soon as lily is doable all of a sudden she's the hottest of them all and then the stepmother in a blind rage gets her killed or wants to get her killed so it's you know psychologically pretty simple it's just women competing on the basis of their looks yeah whereas here the mirror is really interesting yeah it's not so clear-cut like the evil version of herself. It is almost like the whole Gollum Smeagol thing. Yes. So my precious, like yeah. that's sort of the <laughs> evil side versus the, oh, but I want to be a good mother. It's almost like that. Not quite. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not as sort of polar opposite characters. But at the same time, you're not sure, is the mirror an entity? Is, is it actually a magical being telling her to do these things. Or is it just a visual representation of her fractured self? Mm, Is she going insane? Is anything magical happening in this movie at all? Which, I mean, towards the end, it's fairly clear that it is, but it might not be. Mm. It could be that this is all told from Claudia's perspective and she is going insane. Mm. She's suffered a traumatic stillbirth and just loses her mind because the mirror starts talking to her immediately after she loses her baby. Mm, So it comes to her at her weakest moment, and I checked, it never tells her something that she doesn't already know or suspect. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing, again, the way that Sigourney Weaver performs it, and it's the contrast how different a woman can look just based on lighting, makeup, Mm. how she performs, how she holds herself. Because intercutting between sweaty, desperate, pale Sigourney Mm. and then the vision in the mirror, which is just stunningly beautiful, Mm. is just amazing, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt Sigourney, you know, she put 110% into the performance. Mm. Some of the other characters, I did feel confused. Like the brother was a bit confusing for me. Yeah, so he's replacing the huntsman in the traditional story. And so he's a mute brother who is a magician on the side. I don't get it particularly. It's a great performance. I mean, the scene where he comes back and he knows full well he hasn't killed Snow White. Mm. Just seeing the panic on his silent face as... Claudia interrogates him. You can tell that he knows he's in trouble. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. It's sure. a fine performance. I'm not really sure what it's doing, particularly thematically or anything else. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I felt like that for all the characters. <laughs> Even going back to Sigourney's character, I kind of wanted to see more of a contrast. Like, I wanted her to be more nice, I guess. I mean, she was. She was nice at the start of the movie. Mm. And she does definitely go through a decline. I don't know. I think because it's Snow White, I wanted like full 100% cackling witch. Right. I wanted like <laughs> fairy tale cackling witch type <laughs> character, which she kind of gets to towards the end. But yeah, I wanted more of that, I think. Yeah, not fully. It's a more uh, nuanced performance than that. And I kind of like it for that, though. I think it shows Sigourney's intelligence. I mean, she was interested in playing this part because Snow White and the Seven Doors was a childhood favourite of hers. She loved the fact that the main character was a pale woman with dark hair because at that time she said all the heroines she was seeing in movies were all blondes. And so as a child with dark hair, she was quite keen to be able to see herself represented on screen. And she was interested in the stepmother because she thought well why on earth would anybody marry this woman she's awful so she was interested in humanizing her and exploring her Mm. psyche and i think that's one thing that they do manage to pull off in this movie you do see her go from being very reasonable i mean that the first scenes with lily lily just comes off as a bitch 
frankly. Mm, sure. Just slapping wine in her face because she's jealous that she has an intimate sexual relationship with her father and she doesn't want to see her mother being replaced in the marital bed, rejecting her offer of a dress that clearly feels as though it's very important to Claudia because it was something she wore as a child. Mm. And just that moment when she says to her, why must we struggle so? Mm. She's clearly reaching out to her and it's not working. So I think going from that to this homicidal maniac that you see towards the very end of the movie. Yeah. I do like it. I think it's a nicely modulated performance that evolves over time. That's the only character that really has an arc and is well performed yeah, and isn't ruined true. by the editing. Mm. Whereas you're right, all the others, not so much. Yeah. I mean, Lily, there's nothing there, is there really? No, there's nothing. I wanted more of a an arc with her mm. as well. Like I wanted her to be even more of a sport brat at the start. Uh, and picture was privileged and expecting everything done. And so even though she was a little bit rorty, do everything for me to the dwarves, not really. I didn't feel much of a change. No. Like I wanted to see like a change of her character, of her growing from, a, you know, a privileged child to taking responsibility and doing whatever she does at the end. I don't know what she's trying to do at the end, but, you know, going back and claiming, I don't know exactly. I don't know <laughs> why she goes back. Why do they go back? Where does Peter come from? I don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the movie. I mean, pretty much from yeah. the Apple scene, which I actually quite liked because it was very, very fairy tale-y. Yes. You know, you've got Sigourney in full makeup, which yeah. get up, <laughs> the bad teeth, and the Apple looks great. That was great. But then after that, the mood just fell apart. Mm. Nothing made any sense. No. And that is because there are huge chunks missing. So do you remember the character of Rolf, who's one of the seven not dwarves? Okay. Played by Anthony Brophy. He's the guy that really does get quite rapey with mm. Snow White. And then the rest of the dwarves say, yes, perhaps you ought to leave now, really. Yes. So he leaves. He has a huge role in the second and third acts and all of it has been removed. What? He became the antagonist. Oh. But it does feel like it's a setup for the rest of the movie. Oh. So he became the antagonist. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there was a huge amount of extra material. So Rolf was meant to return, offer his services to Claudia. So kind of replacing her brother, I guess. Right. And okay. he is the one that lures Lily into the woods with two accomplices. He chases her around dressed as a, a monster after luring her out by calling her name and she mistakes it for her father. Mm -hmm. All of that's gone. So you just get this really weird clunky scene with no threat and then a hurricane with trees falling over for no reason. You don't know why. <laughs> and then you're supposed to see him again at the castle having eaten himself to death with an apple stuffed in his mouth because Claudia has taken her revenge on him for not managing to kill Lily again. Oh, so there's wow. huge amounts of scenes missing. Like, um, like he said, with her being in the glass coffin after having eaten the apple, that was much longer. There was a lot of suspense. There was a lot of, oh, oh she's really dead. And, and there was a whole build up towards her waking up. And did you really see her eye flicker there? And, and it was sort of this long, I get the sense it was a, the way he describes it, it was like a 1989 abyss resuscitation scene. Right. Breathe, breathe. Yeah. That's what it was supposed to be with a confession of love and a demand that she come back and all this kind of thing. But because they got bored of it, obviously, whoever was in the editing room, they just cut it down to eye flicker, quick cough, she's alive. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so, just miraculous. Yeah. <laughs> like, it felt like a huge build up to like what we know as Snow White and, and, you know, the climactic part of Snow White. And then it just fizzled. Yeah, it does. It does feel like this movie is trying to do two things. Obviously, it's trying to do a fantasy, but it's trying to do a gritty, reimagined drama version of that fantasy. Yeah. But it doesn't go full drama at the same time. Like, I would have loved to have seen all those scenes with Ralph because it would have made it much more threatening mm. and menacing and like there's actual peril. Whereas she's just kind of wandering around, she goes into a coma for a bit, and then she goes home. Which, <laughs> that's not interesting. I mean, <laughs> no. 
Well, what about the seven dwarves then? Let's talk about them. So instead of dwarves, we have a bunch of guys who are outcasts. Mm. They all have scars for some reason. Yeah. Absolutely every single one of them has been burned or cut or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've been persecuted for not getting involved in the Crusades, especially the lead yes. character, Will, played by Gil Bellows. Mm -hmm. So as a group of social outcasts, one of whom she actually falls in love with, so the prince is completely friend-zoned at that point. Yep. What did you make of their as a an alternative to the dwarves yeah. what it's doing thematically and instead of a prince it's an outcast that she falls in love with yeah any good i i, I mean <laughs> i like that they were trying to do something different but i yeah as i mentioned before i was confused like some of them seem good and then some of them seem bad but they all kind of seem the same at the same time apart from will He's got a scar, but let's face it, there's no scar there. It's it's, it's like <laughs> the least. It's the sexy <laughs> scar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a sexy scar. I, I felt like their romance felt very forced to me. I kind of was excited when they introduced the dwarves because it almost felt like Terry Gilliam-esque, mm. like weird angles and, <laughs> and all these strange characters like talking directly at the camera. But then there was nothing else to it. Like there was nothing distinguishing about them. There was no weird quirkiness. I, I wanted some weird quirkiness. I wanted some, yeah, I guess I wanted the fantasy movie. I wanted these strange people living on the ground. I wanted like... Amelie type quirkiness, like right. <laughs> weird set pieces and strange um, production design for their dwellings. And I don't know, like everything felt like it was in a studio, even the mine. Yeah. Like I'm surprised it hadn't collapsed earlier. Like it seems to be <laughs> held up by two sticks. <laughs> Well, the film was shot in the Czech Republic and there's a lot of location shooting. There's a lot of real castles being used. For the most part, it looks beautiful. It does look beautiful, but kind of artless. You know, it's not very expressionistically used. Sure. It's just kind of flat daytime shooting, maybe with a bit of smoke in the background. You know, you compare it to something like Ridley Scott's Legend, which is entirely shot indoors, and that is heavily designed mm. visually. It gives the director and the production designer complete control, so it's very expressionistic. Whereas this is just somebody walking around in the woods in daytime. It's not particularly magical, I don't think. Well, I think that's what they were going for, weren't they? I think They're it is, yeah. Gritty realism. <laughs> well, is it flat, gritty realism? No, because everybody looks terribly clean. Yeah. But I mean, that's just movies being movies. Yeah, like, I suppose so. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it doesn't look magical. Like, it felt very tangible and very, not realistic, but what I would imagine being the medieval times. Like, even the costume design was very well done. Oh, the costumes are stunning. Nothing, like, hugely stood out, but I think that's what they were going for. They were trying to make it. I guess, more period accurate. I'm not sure whether it was, but it felt like a lot of muted colours, like a lot of scenes that did really look like a painting, like a moving painting. Yeah. All of Sigourney's dresses are really amazing mm. and very carefully chosen, apparently. So all of the colours have particular meanings. So the first time you see her, she's in yellow, which seems very bright and spring-like and positive, but it could also hint towards cheery madness. Oh, OK. And as it goes on, I think her dresses get darker and darker. Ah, right. OK. Yeah. At the scene where Lily finally, after the stillbirth, she really realizes that she's been too harsh on her stepmother. I noticed when she goes back to apologize to her and put out a fig leaf, not fig leaf, olive, olive branch. branch, put out <laughs> fig leaf. <laughs> to hide her private. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, put out a, an olive branch yes. to her. She is wearing the dress that, she is. that they had the argument about before. So, I mean, it's all very carefully chosen and very carefully designed. And mm. I appreciated that for sure. I did too, I did too. Like, it didn't feel tacky. Yeah. I'm just comparing it to some other Snow White movies. So, mm. Mirror Mirror, which is directed by a very good director, Tasim Singh. 
is not a good movie. Right. Like there's even less character development. I think it got nominated for an Oscar for costume design. It's amazing costumes. Definitely not period accurate. I mean, <laughs> they're incredible, but yeah, definitely not from the time. That's the Julia Roberts one, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's ah, a, I haven't seen it. The whole movie feels like a studio movie. Like right. nothing looks real. Okay. It looks like it's from a movie. Right. So, like, <laughs> incredibly bright colored clothing and too sharp focus and color grade. And it looks good. It's not a good movie to watch. Yeah. And then, of course, you've got Snow White and the Huntsman, which is the post Twilight. Yeah. Kristen Stewart. Kristen Stewart. Uh, it's one of the Hemsworths as well. Isn't yes. It? I think he admitted that he just did the generic medieval accent, which is just a cross between. Scottish and English and pretty much all <laughs> all the UK <laughs> accents just joined together. Is it Liam or is it Chris? I think it's Chris. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I never know. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, I yeah, it can be confusing. I I didn't mind that one, Snow White and the Huntsman. I haven't seen the second one. No, um, the sequel. It was fine. They'd done the Van Helsing like more actiony, yeah, CGI filled fairy tale and there's not a lot of dark themes or anything it's more yeah the modernized cgi drenched yeah fairy tale that they're doing these days yeah and another star turn in the evil stepmother role with charlie's theron yeah isn't it so yeah. i don't know i feel like snow white is a tough story to pull off because it, I don't know whether there has been a good one apart from, you know, maybe the Disney animated version. Yeah. But I mean, are there other Snow White movies that you would say have pulled the story off? I can't think of any, to be honest. Mm. And I haven't seen some of the adaptations that you're talking about. So right, yeah. it's never been something that's really pushed buttons for me. It doesn't feel as though it's something that has much potential in terms I of mean, it's, it's simple. Like, there's not much mm. to it. Um, yeah, I, I think this movie, Snow White, A Tale of Terror, does try, but maybe it's because of the edit and having a, a protagonist not really being a character at all that changes or it changes a little bit, but not really. Yeah, it, it felt like the movie was going nowhere. I know. There's supposed to be a turning point for her when she attempts to rescue Lars, one of the characters that stands out a little bit, but I guess that's just because he's played by Brian Glover, who was a very fine English actor. Oh, okay. He'd been with Sigourney Weaver in Alien 3 five years before, quite memorably, and a lot of people will recognise him from American Werewolf in London as being one of the guys in the pub. Uh -huh. This was his third to last film, sadly. He died of a brain tumour in June 97, so two months before this film wow. aired on TV which is a shame but he's a yeah he's a lovely actor and they have a moment and then during the weird hurricane tree felling sequence he mm. gets trapped and she tries to rescue him and that i think is supposed to be the moment when we see right her selfless bravery emerge i didn't see that and then she goes home to her father but i'm not sure why no. yeah I, I felt like there were supposed to be a lot of turning points that we just didn't see yeah because they were edited out yeah it's like the whole love triangle thing because peter the prince he shows up now she was besotted with him at the beginning of the movie when she was quite girlish mm. and claudia tells her off for meeting with him when she's still in her nightdress mm. which seems like a reasonable thing for a mother to do and then when he shows up, she just gets off with the outlaw guy, Will, and just ignores Peter. Yeah. I don't know. And then Peter just gets unceremoniously thrown out a window. Thrown out of a window <laughs> by Claudia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although she does go back with him and leave Will behind. I think there was supposed to be more development there in terms of this love yeah. triangle. Yeah. Like that she knows that she's in love with Will, but she knows that socially she can only really go back with Peter. I don't know. Mm. Production-wise, the costume's great. I think sometimes the film looks a bit cheap, like... Um, particularly the scene when Claudia arrives and the whole village turns out to see her, all 12 of them. <laughs> it looks pretty small. <laughs> but then you have things like the banquet scene inside yeah. the castle where Sigourney is impressing us with her operatic yes. singing skills, yes. which the first time it happens, I thought, that's not her voice. And then the second time it happens, I thought, 
oh, that does sound actually like it's her. So I'm oh, okay. confused. Yeah. But yeah, that scene, there are a lot of extras in costume. It looks mm. really sumptuous. So it's sort yeah. of up and down in terms of how good it looks. In terms of how it's shot, I think sometimes like the introduction of the outlaws, the dwarves, you know, it's interesting. It's well shot, but sometimes it's like a soap opera. Mm. Like yeah. when Lily and Will have their argument for the first time, which is supposed to be character development. I take it you have no manners and all this kind of thing. And he's accusing her of just being, you know, a princess and mm. pointless. Mm. It finishes with him turning away from her and her turning away towards the camera. And he's in the background out of focus with his back to her. Classic. They just linger like classic that for a moment. It's, yeah, it's classic soap. We're going into the washing powder commercial yeah. moment. It's. I just thought, no. So just a few lapses here and there. But generally, I thought it was pretty handsomely mounted and effective. Yeah, I would say like... If you pause to any frame in the movie, it does look like a good movie. Visually, it does jump off the screen. Even just having it in a tangible forest, like an actual real forest, is enough for me. Yeah. I mean, I recently watched Jungle Cruise, and there's no point in that entire movie where I felt like we were in the Amazon. No. And so having real trees makes a difference. Yeah, it does. I just wish that more had been done with it to make it yeah. look not necessarily ridiculously fantastical, but just maybe expressing something. The cinematographer actually is Mike Southon, Southon a British cinematographer. Uh -huh. And one of his previous films was Paper House. <laughs> oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah. So he is quite an accomplished and busy cinematographer with a very, very long list of credits. Mm, okay. But yeah, I don't know. It just looks very flat. Yeah, I didn't think it looked that flat. The only thing I could fault set wise was the apple that she picks from a very not looking apple tree. Yes, <laughs> like, I know. <laughs> like they've just glued an apple to an oak tree or something. They have exactly that. And the director mentions it in the commentary <laughs> and how ashamed he is. They were going to try to find an apple tree and plant it there, but oh, they couldn't. Wow. So yeah. they found a nice tree and glued an apple to it. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, anyone that knows anything about trees... That's ridiculous. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Now it's time for Random Trivia. So, Dan, what fascinating piece of trivia did you dig up in a mine alongside a bunch of scarred reprobates today? <laughs> well, in that scene where Sam Neill is... Is he searching for Lily or is he just hunting? He's on a horse. Yeah, he's searching anyway. for her, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. So in that scene, he, he falls off and has this accident and breaks his leg. So Sam Neill actually did that. Ooh. That did actually happen. I mean, not that scene in the film, but he did fall off a horse. And I think oh. the horse fell on top of him. Ow. And so he was injured, but thankfully, you know, not killed. Um, so Not yes. <laughs> life imitating art. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Sam. I did worry about the horses in this movie, especially the beginning with the carriage scene, because it looks as though they deliberately made a horse roll down a hill. I always worry about horses in movies. All the time. Yeah. Uh, because they are yeah, made to fall over, get shot. And I don't know how they do that with horses. I don't know how they train horses to do those things, but... Yeah. Well, they used to trip them on purpose, know. and I don't think they're allowed to do that now, but they used to. And really? I just worry because this is filmed in the Czech Republic, and you think maybe standards are different in different Ooh, countries, and maybe, yeah. you know, they can push a horse down a hill. I don't know. Just that and the scene where the wolves are attacking one of the horses, you just think that looks a bit real ish. Yeah. I'm worried that this isn't simulated. Yeah. I think in the commentary, the director does say that that isn't a real wolf. The bites is uh, just a puppet. Okay, yeah. So, better? <laughs> better, <laughs> yeah. Know. Still, I don't know. <laughs> still scares me. Yeah, yeah. I'm always afraid of, of horses in movies. Yeah, people couldn't care less. Yeah, <laughs> horses. Sam Neill, whatever. <laughs> but horses? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Save the horses. And that's our trivia. Yeah. 
What did you think of John Ottman's music? Or what do you think of John Ottman generally? I mean, I like him. I didn't realise he did so many great movies. Like a lot of Liam Neeson movies, yeah. for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Non-stop, unknown. And then he's done like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and uh, Lake Placid and H20 that we've covered. Yeah. Halloween 20 years later. Uh, Usual Suspects and uh, X-Men Days of Future Past. So like he's a very notable composer. It was fine. I don't know. It was nothing that really did stand out for me for this film. It, it worked. Yeah. I think the one thing I would say, it feels a little bit too overspotted and busy and florid and insistent, particularly at the beginning. It feels sure. like the movie's not given room to breathe and settle so that we can actually engage with the characters and listen to what they're saying to each other. Yeah. I mean, I did expect that from a kind of a fairy tale mm. type movie. Fantasy tends to be overspotted, I find. Yeah, I think it's because it, it, so much work is being done to establish a heightened mode of performance, you know, mm, that it's sure. all a little bit hyper real and hyper dramatic, maybe. Yeah. But interestingly, the director wanted something a lot simpler, very few instruments. He didn't want a traditional orchestral score, he wanted real medieval instruments and something stripped down oh that would have been really interesting would have been wouldn't it yeah because it, it did seem quite stock standard fantasy orchestral yeah it does very well done it was but yeah just very obvious i guess mm. i think it's pretty obvious what the producers were going for especially if you watch the trailer right so the trailer is entirely spotted with music from dracula it's all oh. Wojciech Kielar's music from bram stoker's dracula which of course was a massive worldwide hit five years before right and i think that's what they're going for it's this is the dark gothic broody romantic reinterpretation of a classic story yeah and you're gonna love it but if they wanted to do that they would have not edited it as much like they would have made it a long <laughs> brooding like you know <laughs> Emotion filled with, with like, yeah, really long scenes with room to breathe and f room for the actors to actually develop yeah. any characters. Yeah. And where's the romance? I mean, that was a very important element of Dracula. Yeah. I didn't get a sense that there was a real relationship going on between no. Will and Lily. Not that I could even tell who they were as people anyway. <laughs> I mean, all in all, probably not the movie that was intended by um, Michael Cohn. No, I would like to see the movie he intended. Mm. I'm not sure it would solve all of the issues that I have with it, but I would like to see what he was trying to do. He was trying to do something a lot less mainstream and a lot less obvious. Mm, yeah. As it was, the film was cut by at least 20 minutes or so, and it was intended for theatrical release, but in the US it was just dumped onto Showtime right. uh, cable TV in august of 1997 so oh wow it was nominated for a lot of awards primetime emmy awards uh lead actress for scorny weaver costume design of course makeup mm. didn't win anything unfortunately but it was nominated right okay yeah i mean i think visually it still stands out michael cohen he doesn't I looked up his other films, I hadn't seen any of them. No, doesn't seem to have had a massive career, which is a shame because on the basis of this, there is a lot of talent there mm. and a perspective that would have been interesting to see on other movies, but right. wasn't to be, I guess. Yeah, I would have loved to have seen his original intention for Snow White. Yeah, I can't see it happening. Well, ever. no, no, I can't. <laughs> Unfortunately. No, I don't think we'll get a director's cut. I, I would have loved to have seen more scenes that, that scene where she thinks she's eating Lily in the stew. Yeah. Like, I, I want more of that sort of real evil, dark complexity of Claudia. Yeah, he talks on the commentary about how that scene is the closest the movie gets to camp. Right. You know, getting to the point where it's sort of really fun. Mm. It is a great performance from Sigourney. That's the thing I enjoy. Mm. Yeah. She puts so much detail into it, just little moments like the scene where she's seducing Peter 
the director mentions that Sigourney came up with this idea that when she kisses him, if you watch closely, all the way through the scene, she's been shorter than him oh, on screen. Okay. Sigourney is actually a very tall woman. Right. And as she kisses him, she stands up to her full height. So she towers over him while she's doing it. Oh, wow. It's really clever. She puts so much thought into absolutely every moment of her performance. Yeah. Physically and vocally. It's interesting to see where Snow White fits in Sigourney Weaver's oeuvre. Mm. Like, I think Alien Resurrection came out in the same year. Yeah. And then Galaxy Quest comes out in 99. Uh, or she was also in Ice Storm and came out in the same year. Three movies that came out in the same year? Yeah. With her in it? Exactly. So it's a huge paycheck revisiting Ripley, this, and then a really serious drama. Because that's Ang- an Ang, that Lee Ang Lee? movie, isn't it? Yeah. I yeah, think I think so. it is. Yeah. It's an odd combo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does show her, like, range. I mean, yeah. going from Alien Resurrection to this to Galaxy Quest. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> she is so funny in Galaxy Quest as well. Yeah. I just wish that we could get to see the cut of the movie where she says, fuck that, at that moment where she's faced with that mashing machine. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so clearly being dubbed with screw that and i would just love to hear her say fuck that because you can mm. see it on her lips but yeah i love <laughs> galaxy quest <laughs> oh it's a great movie yeah i think it speaks volumes that when we're supposed to be talking about snow white we're talking about <laughs> galaxy quest instead <laughs> coming to you live from the movie oubliette theater it's the prestigious movie awards It's the Moobly Awards, it's where we present our favourite ruby red apple parts of the film and a number of broken mirrors, a thousand years of bad luck categories. <laughs> I mean, there were, there were a lot of mirrors being broken by Lily. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I don't know why either, but there we go. <laughs> exactly. Best quote. My favourite quote uh, comes from the very end of the movie where Lily says to Claudia, you have no heart. And Claudia replies, that's too simple. Mm. And I love that as a statement for Mm -hmm. the underlying intent of the movie, which is she's not purely evil. She's a human being with motivations and there's a reason why she is the way she is. And it's not because she's heartless. Far from it. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I love Mm -hmm. that. And I thought that was a really great scene, actually. The whole finale where she kills her, I think, is amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's it's, definitely a a showstopper. Uh, My Mm. favourite quote, I did want the fantasy movie that this wasn't. So, of Mm. course, my favourite quote is, Never look a raven too long, it might steal your soul. Because that's the stuff I love in fantasy. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Best hair or costume? Sigourney is the ugly witch, cause oh yeah, oh I loved it. I loved it. I loved the bad teeth and the weird face and the oh, it's everything I could, could ever want from a Snow White movie. Yeah, and the headdress as well. It's that that medieval headdress thing that just happens to look like a demon's horn. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's perfect, isn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah. It is a good look. More generally, I wrote down that I like that Claudia's perm gets crazier and wilder and more 80s the more her power and mania increase throughout the movie Mm -hmm. i called it her permometer because at the beginning it's tightly controlled in nets and things it's contained and then towards the end of the movie she's flouncing around with it just everywhere she goes full (laughs) zool from ghostbusters it's great (laughs) most 90s moment this movie was so 80s to me. Do you think? Like, it was... Yeah, I, I felt very 80s. Like, the only 90s thing I could really pick out, which is what my wife picked out, is the look of Snow White. The whole kind of mousy, round-faced, raven hair thing was quite big in the 90s, especially with Christina Ritchie. Oh, um, right, yeah. Playing that sort of type character mm. um, and, and being very innocent and naive... But yeah, I don't know, 90s for me, it wasn't, it wasn't very 90s to me. Uh, well, I thought that it kind of fits into the darker, edgier, gothic thing that really came yeah. up in the 90s. Yeah, that's true. 
Like it wasn't it wasn't the fantasy film that I wanted, the eighties fantasy film. With the quirky characters yeah. and the puppetry and the yeah, yeah. the magical crystals and that that's what I wanted. So that was yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. It wasn't it was a nineties updated, gritty, dark version of that. Yeah, so Bram Stoker's Dracula, the wolf with Jack Nicholson in, the witches, the crow, death becomes her the Adams Family movies with Christina Ricci mm, that yes, you mentioned, yes, yes. Interview with a Vampire, Sleepy Hollow. It just, it to me, it felt as though the darker, grittier fantasy movie was very much a '90s thing. Mm, okay, okay. Favorite scene? I think we may pick the same one. The last scene, with the mirrors and the fire and the the rapid aging of uh, Lady Claudia. Again, all I ever wanted in this fantasy movie. <laughs> yeah, some girl-on-girl girl violence and a bit of magic. I love it when she stabs the mirror and it oh, it goes stabs the mirror. And uh, yeah, it stabs. Yeah. Yes, yes, Claudia, yes, yes. yeah. Uh, it's interesting you pointed out the whole, the, the, the fact that all the male characters are just sidelined. Yeah. Because uh, it was kind of nice having a, a climactic final scene, not having the prince or the love interest come in and save the day and you know <laughs> no <laughs> the prince goes out the window quite literally does wow it? yes it's he does. Like, <laughs> 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 bye <laughs> <laughs> my favorite actually is the the culmination of act one it's the turning point i think for claudia so she is singing in a banquet in front of an admiring crowd she looks beautiful, her husband is captivated by her, and her hands are resting on her pregnancy bump. The world is perfect for Claudia, and then in comes Lily, stealing the limelight, wearing her dead mother's dress, dances with her father, completely taking the attention away from Claudia, and you just see her withering inside, and then there's the whole spinning camera around the dancing and the mm. spinning camera around Claudia as she starts to feel unwell and then she collapses and she loses the baby. I just thought this is just visually really striking use of camera to evoke a, a inner feeling and the combination of the two things happening at once. Yeah, I just, I dramatically and visually, I thought it was great, that sequence. Mm. Yeah, really was. Most cliche fantasy moment. The only thing I could pick out really was the medieval European setting for mm. fantasy because most of it, just like the film's tagline, the fairy tale is over, it averts many of the usual cliches that the stepmother isn't actually evil to begin with. Mm. She becomes it, but she isn't to begin with. The prince doesn't come to the rescue. There's no true kiss that brings the princess back to life. Mm -hmm. The merry miners are actually miserable outlaws. You know, I just thought that it's <laughs> it's not actually that cliched, but maybe yeah. you spotted yeah. something. There. I mean, you can't have fantasy without just random animals. Snakes, <laughs> ravens, rats, gotta have them. Mm. I mean, yeah, what, what, what is a python doing in Czechoslovakia? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> in a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Best special effect. For me, my favourite special effect, I quite like that blanket scene. There's a scene with, mm. I think, Claudia and the blanket kind of moves by itself and like... Thought it was really well done. Yeah, Sigourney Weaver's writhing under there. Mm. That whole scene was a lot more complicated and abstract, and it was like a real ordeal for Claudia to turn into that old lady, and all of it was cut out. All of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Damn. It's a shame. <laughs> yeah. How about you for the special effect? I didn't really have a special effect that I liked. Uh, you know, I'm, I thought the effect on her hair in the mirror was fairly subtle and simple. And, and oh, the morphing, effect is, sort of warpy looking, yeah. Yeah, so it kind of gave you a sense that, you know, she was almost verging on Medusa, but not quite, you know. It's, mm. it's sort of interesting. I mean, the main thing I was impressed with was actually the stunt of Peter going out the, the window, because... 
It lingers. It's, it's yeah. it lingers, yeah, and it's it's that that's a long fall from that castle window. So yeah. I mean people have pointed out that he goes out of the window backwards on the set and then when you cut to the exterior he goes out forwards and apparently that was because the stuntman said, Look, I've gotta go forwards because I need to control my landing oh, here wow. and I can't yeah, do that yeah, backwards. Sure. Yeah, they kinda got that wrong. But it's a great stunt, so Yeah. Well done to that team. It was. Favorite sound effect. For sound effect, I didn't have anything. <laughs> I, I don't really? know. Really? Yeah, nothing wow. really stood out for me. No, I didn't think of a sound effect specifically, but uh, the raven I was particularly thinking of because the scene where uh, Claudia commands it to give her its eyes and wings, it sounds like it shouts no. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, oh, wow. I don't know. Maybe it was just me. Maybe my ears were playing tricks on me. But I, th- I thought it just goes no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not keen. Right. Most, Most funniest, funniest moment. moment. So this is definitely unintentional, and I'm sure it was a tradition. But the scene where Claudia and Sam Neill's character, Mr. Hoffman, get married, and they're they're sitting on their <laughs> marriage bed. <laughs> <laughs> like naked, I'm assuming, underneath the covers, yeah, yeah. while the entire village household blesses them. <laughs> yeah. Before they, they copulate, I guess. <laughs> they just parade by and bless the marital bed and, yeah, hope that this is all very fertile and great, you know. Yeah, it's a bit much, isn't it? But some cultures do that. I'm, don't I'm they? sure. I'm sure it's based on an actual tradition that was probably very uh, normal back then. But yeah, I found that hilarious. <laughs> it is. It's, I mean, so awkward as well. Why is Lily there? I mean, she. What is she like? Ten? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, just come and throw some wine on your stepmother and your dad before they go at it yeah. on their wedding night. That's a bit much, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. So funny for you then? Well, it's another damp moment, oddly enough. Oh, yes. And this is right after Lars has died in the weird hurricane tree sequence. And for some reason, you just like the camera pulls away on a scene of the dwarves and Will appears to be taking a shower in the corner of the room in front of everybody and i don't understand is it a medieval shower that they've rigged up or is he standing in the rain shirtless right i do i just don't understand what's going on the camera just pulls out and there's will showering (laughs) um awkward okay it reminded me of friends that scene where joey he has that indoor water feature that looks like water going down a window Mm -hmm. and you cut to him during a sad moment and he's just there looking out of his water feature (laughs) it just reminded me you know will's just over in the corner being moody with his shirt off with water (laughs) sprinkling on it what's going on (laughs) Sorry, I just burst into hysterics. I right. just thought, what's happening? I need to watch that again. Yes. It's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our move, please. Mm. Hello, this is Robert Picardo, and you're listening to Movie Oubliette. And we are back. Final verdict time. Should the 1997 Snow White, A Tale of Terror, be freed from the fairy tale oubliette to be loved by all along with its unconventional dwarves? Or should it be cast down from the tower to fall to its fateful death in the depths (laughs) of the oubliette torn out of fairy tale folklore? Conrad, you had seen this movie before. How does it live up on, on the more recent watch? Well, I'd completely forgotten anything about it other than Sigourney being in it and it being this sort of darker, grittier take on the material. And so revisiting it, I was kind of hoping that maybe it was, uh, you know, an adult movie I didn't appreciate at the time when I first saw it. But it just doesn't quite 
get there. It's not particularly a tale of terror. It's not really graphically gothic and terrible. I mean, it's clearly not for kids. There's mm. too much churning sexual tension and psychodrama <laughs> going on. And that's the bit I love. The first act, the whole interplay between the stepmother and the daughter, mm. Uh, mm. all of that is really great and really promising. And the production is sometimes good, sometimes not as great as I want it to be. But then the, the second and third acts just fall apart. And I don't know what anybody's motivation is or what's happening and why anybody's doing anything that they're doing. And it's it feels as though it's been ridiculously compromised by mm. the post-production woes. And I would love to see what the director intended originally. I, I love the idea of taking an innocent child's fairy tale, which does have, I mean, they do have dark elements, these grim tales, mm. and really going full bore, terrifying fantasy with adult themes in there with deeper characters and it, it does that for a third and then it kind of all goes to hell so on reflection i think no i think if this kind of ticks some boxes for you it's an interesting one to look back on to complete your filmography it's not going to disappoint you in some aspects sigourney weaver's performance is incredible mm. but i mean she's always incredible I, I don't know her doing a bad performance really so it's worth it for that maybe but i just cannot see myself championing this movie out of the oubliette i think it's there for a reason it's because in its current form it just didn't really come together mm, yeah it's such a strange film to critique because for the most part it is a really well-made film mm. like it's 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 got great actors in it it looks great it's filmed i think reasonably well it's great costumes yeah. but the editing destroys the plot like i mm. have no idea why anyone is doing anything in the last act the fact that Sigourney Weaver's character is the only character you can really hold on to and, and feel like they're going through an arc, whereas everyone else kind of doesn't change. And that's not what I want to watch in a movie. I want to see change and development and conflict not being resolved so easily. So, yeah, I did feel by the, the second half, I I was just watching things unfold with no tension. <laughs> and then it ended, yeah. and the ending was great, but no sense of direction towards that ending. No, it doesn't feel earned. You're right. I, I think you summed it up well before when you said it's, you know, a bunch of problems that just resolve themselves. Yeah, they do. <laughs> so... Yeah, and no protagonist. Who's the protagonist in this? Because Snow White is is kind of nothing, really. Yeah, I would have loved to have seen the original intention, the original edit yeah. with the original score, what was intended. That would have been a really interesting movie. But yeah. Yeah, but we can only adjudicate on the film we have, mm. not the film we wanted. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's going back in, isn't it? It is. Okay, uh, let me just thrust it towards this window. <laughs> <laughs> so, listeners, if you want to keep up to date with our future episodes, you can follow us on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as Movie Oubliette. You can also email us at movie.oubliette at gmail.com. Yes, please tell us, did you like Snow White, A Tale of Terror? Are there other Snow White movies out there that we should be watching? Yeah. Is there a really good, gritty, exciting interpretation of it? I'd love to see that. Yes. Uh, and if you want to support us even more, you can go to Patreon, where for as little as a dollar, you can get access to extended segments from our podcast or full interviews with our guests. Yes, and for $5 you get access to our exclusive monthly minisodes where we talk about a new or recent film. Yes, yes, we did VHS 94 most recently. That was fun. Yes, we did that for Halloween. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this month we'll be doing sci-fi. We'll be talking about the Tom Hanks movie Finch. Yes, really looking forward to that. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, Listeners, if you have always wanted some merchandise with with our cartoonized <laughs> faces on them, you can uh, head over to Redbubble and find a plethora of different items to adorn your house. Mm, they make great Christmas gifts. 
<laughs> yes, they do make good Christmas gifts. Yes. And speaking of the festive holiday season, our very next episode, Dan, will be our Christmas episode. Oh, yes. What festive film will we be discussing? Well, we will be not talking about Home Alone, which uh, famously was uh, rebooted on Disney Plus this year. (laughs) Badly, by all accounts, which is (laughs) no surprise. Instead, we will be visiting the 1989 French horror thriller version of the Home Alone story. Deadly Games. Oh, okay. So French for Christmas. French for Christmas. It's also known as 3615 Code Pair Noel. Oh, that's much more memorable. Deadly Games. (laughs) It is, yeah. Game Over, Hide and Freak. There are so many names. But I think if you look for Deadly Games, you'll find it on Shudder and uh, other streaming services, (laughs) perhaps. Thankfully, we'll not be alone in this endeavour. We will be joined by a returning special guest and friend of the pod, director of The Clove Hitch Killer, Duncan Skiles. So I'm really looking forward to that. Mm, That's going to be fun. It is, yes. So join us then. Yes, just in time for Christmas. Indeed. Well, bye for now. Goodbye. You make always sound so monotonous.